Hi everyone, welcome Hi. back another episode of the Space Roundup. Hey Nick and Terry, how are you guys doing? Good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Hope you're well. Awesome. Great to have you. Thanks for joining us. And I hope you guys have another great show. Cheers. Uh, it's nice. Right. We we took a month off, didn't we, Terry? <laughs> yeah, they did it. <laughs> well, basically, yeah, the show's now going monthly. And obviously, during lockdown, we were every two weeks. Um, lockdown's thankfully now uh, pretty much come to an end um, for most of Western society anyway, unless you're living in China. Sorry about that. Um, and we just thought every month, yeah, people are zoomed out, um, but we still enjoy the show. Hopefully, the people who listen and people who tune in and uh, turn up on the chat, hopefully you enjoy the show as well. So, yeah, we've gone monthly, um, but we're still with you. Um, and it gives us more time to think up some interesting stories. And we have got some absolute classics tonight. Um, yeah, so hopefully anyone in the chat, please fire in loads of questions as much as you can. Uh, we always love answering your questions. If you've got any interesting ones, take us off in all sorts of tangents. Um, without further ado, though, we'll, we'll kind of kick off. Um, if you see me looking this way, this is my, well, I've got three monitors here. Um, basically, just show me different things that are happening as, as part of the show. So if you see me looking over that direction, uh, that's where we're coming from. So our opening story tonight, um, they finally did it. Um, so Boeing and their kind of their travails, as it were, they've had they've had a long ride with this one. This has been tough for Boeing. And don't forget Boeing's, you know, history of the space program goes back to like the Apollo era, etc. They were one of the prime contractors, um, you know, with NASA, working with NASA for decades now. Um, but they've had a lot of issues, not only with the SLS, the space launch system, which, you know, has got its own set of problems and issues and cost overruns and budget overruns, etc. The CST-100, which is their, they're calling it their 21st century space capsule. So it's basically designed to look almost like the Apollo uh, command module. So uh, similar kind of capsule design, a little bit larger uh, than the Apollo CM was. Apollo CM was designed to hold three people, the CST-100 Starliner, uh, which is only designed for low Earth orbit. Uh, operations, so kind of bringing astronauts and cargo to and from the International Space Station. That's able to take up to seven people. So, you know, technically this thing should have been flying and delivering astronauts to the space station for the last couple of years, much like SpaceX have been doing with the Crew Dragon. Um, but they've had a lot of issues. So in 2019, they had an issue where the launch didn't go nominally. Uh, they didn't reach the orbit that was needed to dock with the ISS. So they had to kind of pull the mission completely uh that then led to a whole load of changes and updates and you know rethinking etc and you know, lo lots and lots of engineering changes and repairs um then last year they had an issue before they even got off the ground where moisture got into uh some of the kind of propulsion system and wrought havoc with some of the valves so it's not been an ideal few years for Boeing in terms of you know costs etc. And then you've got obviously got all Boeing Airlines issue with the 737 Max and the tragedies that have happened there. So uh, they're not having a good time of it. Let's put it that way. Uh, so this one OFT2. So this is Orbital Flight Test 2. So after the last one wasn't so successful, obviously it didn't work, and the one before that didn't work. This was their first kind of really serious attempt to, to get this you know done and dusted and it was pretty good a six day mission um as i said they'd have those two failures so no crew on this one it was again just a, an uncrewed kind of test flight they did put rosie rocketeer the mannequin <laughs> on board so they put in a flight test dummy as it were strapped up to the eyeballs with all sorts of sensors etc to check things like you know g-forces and all sorts of things you know make sure that it is going to be a comfortable ride for the between four and seven astronauts that the thing is able to take uh, depending on what they've got in terms of cargo and crew configurations so this one was predominantly designed to deliver cargo up to the iss um it still had issues so as it was approaching docking, they had realized that one of the um, thrusters that was designed for orbital maneuvers and its backup had both failed. So this caused a whole slew of issues and they had to chain, you know, if anyone was watching the live coverage, there was a, there was a bit of a kind of standoff between the CST and the ISS for quite some time. That wasn't just down to the thruster issues though, there's a docking ring and the docking ring also didn't deploy on time. So they had that basically which delayed the docking by an hour um, so they've still got some things to iron out then it docked successfully the crew on the iss basically did a tour inside checked rosie's health status you know did the crew um 
cargo transfer, etc. Probably got rid of some of their rubbish, uh, sent it back down. Then, I mean, the, the whole advantage with this, as opposed to Apollo, Apollo was always designed really for a splashdown, for a landing in water. Um, three parachutes, although if you remember of Apollo 15, only two of them worked, but it was designed for that. It was designed to take it. So you've got a combination of, again, the three parachute system with this, plus the kind of retro thrusters that you have on some of the Soyuz spacecraft when they come down. And it's designed to be able to land on a hard surface uh, without too much of an impact felt by the crew. And you look at, obviously, what Blue Origin are doing and even what SpaceX are doing in terms of their reusability and their, you know, especially Blue Origin's case with the capsule you know, landing, as it were, very similar technology, very similar concepts. The problem is, after it landed, it was leaking hydrazine. Now, hydrazine is not something you want to be anywhere near when you're a recovery crew. So this hydrazine cloud basically surrounded the uh, landed spacecraft, landed in the new... Back into, obviously, a test facility. They're going to try and iron out some of these kinks. There may be, because of these issues with the docking ring and the thrusters and the hydrazine leak, there may still need to be an uncrewed test flight. Who knows? I mean, they're, they're hoping not. They're hoping that the next flight will be a crewed flight because it's, you know, this is a $4.3 billion contract that Boeing have got with NASA. And, you know, this is supposed to be delivering, as I said, SpaceX have been delivering now for two years, crew with Crew Dragon. And their success rate in terms of launch and land and relaunch, uh, to quote the famous song parody that was done about SpaceX, is now people don't even bat an eyelid. You know, if if SpaceX blows up, it's it's more of a story than if they land. It's kind of, you know, they just do it. They just land all the time and, and pretty successfully. So um, I don't know what you think, thoughts are on this, Terry, in terms of Boeing's, you know, long-term prospects uh, against SpaceX, because SpaceX, don't forget the costs. SpaceX have driven the cost down astronomically, pardon the pun. And this thing's still only designed for 10 missions. Yeah. So after 10 missions, it's you can't use it again. Whereas SpaceX, you know, their cadence at the moment on some of their launches is is up in that like, that kind of number. So and they're coming back obviously for atmospheric re-entry, refactoring, repurposing the spacecraft and launching again. So now in what was it, a two and a half, three week turnaround? It was something ludicrous recently. I've forgotten the, the exact numbers. I don't know what your thoughts are, Terry, on, on yeah. Boeing's kind of future with this, but yeah. Just one point, you uh, sort of froze there for about three or four seconds, so you might want to check your, your connection. Oh, but yeah, yeah. Um, but, now, uh, the, the thing is about this, while it is to be reusable uh, up to 10 times, which is 10 times more than Apollo, uh, it's a six-month turnaround, apparently. So, yeah. you know, so there needs several of them on, on the go. Uh, obviously, it's a, a much more sophisticated, as well as being larger spacecraft than Apollo, you know, with updated electronics and software and all the rest of it. Um, so th I suppose there's more to go wrong than there was on uh, on the Apollo uh, the, the main command service module and the uh, the actual uh, conical bit that this is based on, which comes back down to earth. But yeah, uh, what strikes me is that all they had to do was to, uh, design a spacecraft, whereas the others were designing the rockets as well. I mean, this thing launches on an existing rocket, the Atlas V, yep. and it has taken them so long just to get a working usable spacecraft. So uh, we've had our views about uh, Boeing and other issues. So I hope this isn't uh, symptomatic of sort of general management and delivery problems in Boeing that they can't get something which is just a spacecraft um, delivered without such, such delays and such problems along the way. Well, the thing is, I mean, they, they've built it in this kind of zero weld um, concept. I mean, it's really quite neat in that they, the structural integrity of it, due to the nature of how it's been designed, should be quite good. But again, as you said, you've got so many potential failure points, as it were, compared to, I mean, obviously with Apollo, you had 6 million unique components on the Saturn V and the command and service module, and they had to have a 99.97% kind of reliability rate. And obviously still we had, you know, there were issues with Apollo 16, with Apollo, you know, 14, there was issues, obviously clearly issues with Apollo 13. Um, 
I mean, things went wrong on most of the Apollo flights. I think the Apollo 17 and 10 were pretty much the only ones that, that didn't have any major issues of any description. Um, so things can go wrong. And I've always had a problem with touchscreens in spacecraft. The whole notion of like crew, if something starts going awry, like, you know, we had with the Gemini mission with Neil Armstrong and Dave Scott, when, it, you know, they were going into a, what was it, two revolutions per second tumble. Yeah, uh, it, was <laughs> it was horrendous. Exactly. And if you've got crew floating about and suddenly a thruster gets stuck and you start spinning out of control and you've got touch screens everywhere. I mean, yes, it's autonomous. You can completely shut down the touch screens. You could robotically control it from the earth. But from a... <sighs> My problem with it isn't so much with low Earth orbit operations. Low Earth orbit operations, you've got like a few hundredths of a second between, you know, detection of an issue and a, sh a potential shutdown. If you've got long duration missions going out to Mars using similar kinds of technology and you have an issue there, we'll, we'll go on to this, I think, with one of our later stories. I think there's still some serious hangups here with, you know, we've, we've looked into this, we've researched some of this in work and the whole issue with touchscreens. And if you've got, say, a mission out to Mars where you've got potentially 20 minute plus, you know, lag times between mm -hmm. what ground operations are even going to detect and something going wrong in the spacecraft. I think there's something to be said for the analog nature of Apollo. <laughs> there's there's yeah. something, yeah. And it's interesting in the <laughs> chat. Hi, Chris. Nice to see you here. Yes, uh, most of the essential functions on Dragon do have physical buttons. But it's this, it's like with the Apollo guidance computer. I don't know if you know the story of the Apollo guidance computer and the whole, you know, thing with Margaret Hamilton and, and the testing yeah. side, when basically the, the P00 command and she was programming it to not enable it to be done despite Eldon Hall and you know various other people in a command chain and line management working on the AGC saying, well, it's never going to happen. These are trained pilots. It did happen, obviously, on Apollo 8. Um, you know, Jim Lovell admitted he, you, know, you can accidentally key in commands. And that's with something that is you know, big, chunky physical buttons uh, with the old AGC. And still, you can, you, know, you can human errors there. So I think you're right, Chris, that yeah, having the physical buttons is one thing, but the old Apollo era spacecraft, you know, you've got these massive switches uh, that are guard. I mean, don't forget they had guards on them, had rail guards on them as well to avoid these accidental kind of misfirings of, you know, <laughs> thrusters or whatever. So it's going to be interesting. It's yeah. it's going to be interesting to see where Boeing go with this. They've got to get it right soon, though, or, you know, SpaceX are just going to completely dominate. Yeah. The thing is, this one is designed only for LEO, yeah. whereas Musk, as we know, has a, aims for both the moon and Mars. But uh, anyway, but uh, of course, the, there's the classic example of what happened with uh, Aldrin and the switch on the LEM to fire the ascent engine. Where yeah, with the pen. Their, yeah. Their, <laughs> their best efforts, they broke one of the switches. <laughs> So that, that's the stuff of nightmares, but it was also, it's the best after dinner story ever, I think, you know, how, how you launch off from the moon using a, some people say it was a barrel, other people say it was a felt tip pen, other people say it was a pencil, but anyway, basically that's what they used to get off the moon. Well, that's the thing as well, if you have kind of any rapid depressurization of the command module for whatever reason, and you've got, you know, anything like that that could go wrong or, you know, screens crack, yeah, I mean, obviously they're they're tested for, for these zero pressure environments. But as you said, with Starliner, Starliner is not really designed for anything other than just simple transfers to and from the space station. If that was to have a rapid depression, I don't know. I'm not a Boeing engineer. If any Boeing engineers want to chip in, definitely. Yeah, Buzz broke the breaker. This is true. Well said, Chris. Um, there's also a great story about wedding rings floating out the capsule but, um, on, on one of the other Apollo missions, but we won't even go there. Um, I like it. I, I do like the design of Starline. I'm just looking at it now, and it is beautifully elegant, and it is very yeah. reminiscent, especially of the boilerplate uh, Apollo command modules. If you ever go to Arizona, to the Barringer Crater, they've got one of the boilerplate um, test articles for Apollo, and it's very, very similar in its kind of elegant simplicity and design. And I said with this zero-weld approach that they've taken, looks very good. Uh, another good point is, you know, Chris has made their Starline account offer non-NASA commercial launches. Yes, obviously. Um, I mean, this is the other advantage. SpaceX seemed to be, he's got his commercial head on. I mean, that's the thing with Musk, you know, Twitter issues aside at the moment and what's going on there, and, you know, certain stocks tanking and crypto and all the other things that he's involved in. From a space perspective, he seems to really have his head screwed on in terms of where he's heading, what he's doing, and how he's going for it. And, you know, we've still got Starship to come, potentially going orbital within the next six to 12 months. So, um, 
Boeing are definitely lagging behind. Um, but if it gives NASA, obviously in these strange times with what's still mm -hmm. happening in Ukraine, we're over 100 days now into the, the whole horrible situation in Ukraine. And the fact that, you know, whilst Dmitry Rogozin is still in charge of Roscosmos, nobody's ever going to work with Roscosmos ever again. Whilst Putin's still in charge of Russia, nobody's going to work with Russia ever again, full stop. And if they do, they're morally bankrupt. Um, it's that simple. So they need this. You know, NASA and the West needs more capability of this kind. So all power to Boeing to get it running. But they, you know, it's not the last chance saloon, but they've really got to get their act together now, in my opinion. But there we go. Yeah. Anyway. And if they ever have to do an emergency exit from um, the ISS, the fact that this holds seven means they can all get back down to Earth uh, in one go. So Absolutely. It is, yeah. yeah. But it's like, you know, if you look at the Skylab, one of the planned um, missions for the Skylab recovery was to, I think it was six they were going to get into, or five they were going to get into an Apollo command module, thinking how small that is just by modifying the seat configuration. Mm. Um, so that's an interesting one. Um, things, anyone, I'm just reading through the chat here. Sierra, yeah, Sierra Space Dream Chaser. I had a really good chat with Buzz Aldrin years ago. So uh, a conference in America called Space Fest. And Buzz was in one of his Buzz grumpy moods, uh, and everyone said, "Oh, stay." I guess I chat to I chat to all the Apollo guys, and but Buzz was the one that kind of people kept saying, "Don't go near Buzz." So I just went up to him and I started talking to him about Snoopy and you know the hunt for Snoopy at the time, and we were looking for it. And he went, "Oh, sit down, sit down." So we were just chatting for about an hour, and um, oh, what's the name? His assistant at the time, I've forgotten the name now. Uh, she was basically glaring at me as if to say, you know, you're just after an autograph. And I wasn't interested in Buzz's autograph at all. But we just got chatting and he was saying, oh, this is what we're doing with Dream Chaser because he was quite involved in it at the time. And uh, that is the return to a shuttle-like spacecraft I think is going to be really important, um, especially I was talking a few days ago with someone about the you know, the future for Hubble and what could happen with the Hubble. And if you had you know the ability like Dream Chaser to have that docking maneuverability capability and to be able to get to the altitudes that the Hubble uh, is at, then being able to do yet another rescue recovery repair mission on the Hubble, if the gyros go or the reaction wheels go or even upgrading the cameras is not impossible again mm -hmm. with starship as well you know the capabilities of starship and what musk is proving time and again in terms of autonomous docking capability um we shall see we shall see christina corp that's it thanks chris it was christina yes um there's a funny story about them in bath as well but i'll tell you that another time where buzz and christina were over in bath and they were hot mics backstage and swearing a lot um but there we go anyway moving on next story um this is a good one as well this is uh this is one of terry's finest uh, over yep. to you, terry. back to the moon again <clears throat> yeah. Right. Um, this uh, ties in with Artemis, which we mentioned a moment ago. The moon is best known probably for the seas, the so-called Mare, which of course are totally dry, the craters and the mountains. But there are a whole lot of other very interesting features like riddles or valleys and so on, and mounds, these domes, which are what we're going to talk about now. Um, they're scattered all over the moon in various places. Some of them are quite big, up to about 80 kilometers diameter. And uh, the thing is that the origin of them is absolutely unknown. Um, so NASA want to study a particular set of uh, domes near the Grothuysen uh, crater, which is on the Oceanus Procellarum. And actually, quite interestingly, it's not all that far away from Runker, where the Shang'e 5 uh, Russian spacecraft landed recently and brought back samples. So uh, if you're used to looking at the moon through an inverted uh, image telescope with uh, north at the bottom and south at the top, down near the bottom, there's a very, very prominent, beautiful feature called the Sinus Iridum, the Bay of Rainbows. And the Grothuysen domes are just uh, to be uh, rather anorakish, just above and to the right of that feature there. So that's the sort of area we're looking at. Now, uh, the interesting thing is that from spectroscopic study, we know that the domes are very rich in silica, so it's a bit like granite. And to form granite-like features on Earth, you need oceans of water and you also need tectonic plates, tectonic subduction, which you don't have either of on the moon. Well, you certainly don't have uh, tectonic plates as far as we know. And while there may have been some water in the past, uh, we believe there was never anything uh, anywhere near like the oceans that we have on Earth. So the question is, 
what form these domes, how do they form, and um, what you know, what's the story behind them? Uh, are they volcanic? Are they some sort of rebound or uplift? Is there a sort of a gaseous element forcing the, the material up? Of course, lunar gravity is only about one sixth that of the Earth. So uh, you haven't quite as much weight of material pressing down with gravity, but basically we, we just don't know. So they, um, the mission or their new requirement from NASA is for a suite of five instruments, which they have called Lunar Vise and Lunar for the Moon and the Vulcan Imaging and Spectros Spectroscopy Explorer. And that's going to be a sort of a, a two pronged mission there'll be a lander and a rover, uh, which will presumably um, both come down together. The lander will stay where it is and the roller will roll off and start exploring the area. And there'll be two sets of instruments on the lander and three on the rover. At the moment, there don't seem to be any plans to actually bring back samples, but the instruments will be very sophisticated and will be able to actually analyze the material on the spot. So we're awaiting for uh, more information on that. NASA have simply put out the requirement for this. So it's all to be designed and so on. It'll be part of the Artemis program. Uh, so that ties in very nicely with what we've been uh, talking about. So the, the overall goals of this part of the, uh, the Artemis project are to study the geology um, in the early uh, part of the, the moon's history. Um, it's another story altogether, but we think basically that the, the moon was formed after a Mars-sized body collided with the Earth, a glancing blow, uh, not very high speed, well, not astronomically speaking anyway, but uh, a glancing blow with the Earth. And the material that was uh, knocked off into space was a combination of the crust of the Earth and the material of the body that hit it. And uh, some of that was lost. Some of that probably fell back down to Earth again, uh, and the remainder clumped together to form the moon. Not just quite as simple as that, but that's the basic idea. So uh, there's a lot of still um, information still that we need to get from the moon to confirm whether that sort of theory is right. And the other interesting thing about this mission is it's going to just study yeast, how yeast develops and grows uh, and evolves if uh, appropriate on the moon in an environment which is not just one sixth of Earth's gravity, but it's also a highly intensely radiative environment. You get radiation from the sun. You also get cosmic rays as well because there's no atmosphere to protect. So uh, domes can be seen in any reasonable amateur telescope. You just need a low angle of lighting so that they form a sort of a shadow. They'll be bright on one side and dark on the other. And if the, the angle of illumination is very low, they will cast a bit of a shadow. But they're not as high as the mountain peaks like uh, Pico and the, the mountains in the Apennines, the uh, lunar Alps and so on. So this is a, an area of great interest to lunar geologists and uh, it'll be a case of watch this space as they say and see what they find. It'd be interesting because obviously the selection process during the Apollo era was, was mainly designed around safety. Um, obviously, for the earlier missions, some of the later missions, obviously, far more. I mean, you have, I say the earlier missions, Apollo 14, you look at the landing site for that and you think, how? <laughs> how did you land there? Um, obviously, now we've got much higher resolution due to Clementine and a whole slew of you know, orbiting probes that have been orbiting the moon, you know, in the past and present, um, still to this day. So we've got much higher resolution data. You only have to look at the data that came back we showed a few months ago from the Indian Space Agency, where, you know, you can see the flags from the Apollo mission etc so being able to you know ascertain a very good landing site for some of the future artemis missions given what they're going to have to land on which as we still know is going to be something you know about the size of a gemini um if spacex would be to, to be believed i mean they're, they're still looking at landing you know basically the top half of a starship almost uh, on the surface of the moon which i'm still you know, I've still got major reservations about and, and the down thrust and, you know, potentially what that's going to do in terms of lunar surface, etc. Um, I love these kind of things because, you know, you, as you said, you look at the collapsed lava tubes, the Apollo 15 site at Hadley Rill, you know, massive collapsed lava tube. And there's still so much to learn from lunar geology. We've only, you know, everybody keeps saying we've only scraped the surface with the Apollo missions and some of the later you know, Russian, et cetera, sample return missions. And, you know, China, obviously, you know, the most recent with the sample return, we still only scraped the surface. And unless we send out a, a kind of 
flotilla of drones, as it were, that could basically, you know, fly around and potentially land small versions of the Apollo lander kind of thing, where you've got, you know, autonomous vehicles that can fly around, land, touch down, pick up samples, drill down, pick up samples, return them to an Artemis style base. I'm talking Artemis, the Andy Weir novel style base mm. um, on the moon. You, you're not going to understand the full extent of what lunar geology you know is really and then we've still got to drill right down deep because as you said you know the the theory is that large mars like body impacted the earth x number of billion years ago and the the catastrophic impact basically gave us our, our earth moon system as we now know it and the moon obviously been a lot closer at the time again interesting in terms of the rotation rate of the earth etc there's so much still to learn from this um I, it fascinates me, and I know for a lot of astronomers, the moon is just an annoyance. Um, it's a light pollution <laughs> annoyance, but it's one of those things. You know, we both knew uh, Patrick Moore, so Patrick in the old days, Terry, and you know, he had a lifetime just studying the moon. It's, oh yeah, it's it's one of those things, and you know, the data coming back still, given it's the closest object to us in the universe, as it were we're still getting remarkable data from it. We're still learning and we're still, you know, trying to understand yeah. so much about it, you know, 50 we, years on from the first landing. So Yeah. We have some very uh, intelligent contributions there, uh, which I like. I think the claggers <laughs> is as good a cut explanation. The soup dragon, everything. Chris. It's, oh, yeah, Chris, it's the soup dragon. Um, or June style syndrome. Yeah, that's a good yeah. one. Um, so that was a good one. Um, this one though, yeah, again, Terry and I both kind of spotted this. Um, this, to me, is one of the big stories of the year. And um, yeah, it's it's if you're into meteorites, this is a big, big story. So this story goes back quite some time, and I'll kind of I'll bring in some props to kind of illustrate it. So 1996, an archaeologist, not an astronomer, not a geologist, an archaeologist, Ari Barashat, um, he was out in the kind of the Great Sand Sea in the western kind of Egyptian Libyan border area. Now, this area is pretty dangerous anyway. It's not somewhere you you take your tourists. It's you know it's a war zone. Obviously, the Libyan border is quite quite difficult, etc. But in this area is a 28,000, I think it's 25, 28,000 square kilometer strewn field of what's called Libyan desert glass. Now, what is Libyan desert glass? I'll show you. This is Libyan desert glass. So this is a piece of basically fused sand. So effectively, what they think happened was that 28 million years ago, an impactor struck that region created what they now think is a 19 mile wide crater. So that has only recently, I say recently in the last few years, been discovered using orbital analysis. Some of the Egyptian astronomers, archaeologists, geologists, etc., seem to think there's a 19 mile wide crater there. Anyway, so this is LDG, Libyan Desert Glass. Now, if you remember the atomic bomb tests at Trinity in the 19, you know, 1940s, etc., and you know, tragic events as they were, but the testing site at Trinity, what happened when they detonated the bombs was it created something called Trinitite, which was effectively like a glass. It was it fused parts of the desert. With this, what they think happened is the impactor exploded over the Libyan desert and pieces of the residual impacting comet or asteroidal body basically got infused into this. So I've got a little torch here on the back of my phone. I'm just going to try and get the lighting right on this so you can see it. Um, and you can maybe see, if I hold this up right, inside this piece of glass, there's little black flecks. Those little black flecks are remnants of the impactor, so is believed, of what created this. And there's thousands and thousands of pieces of this all over the Libyan desert. So this archaeologist, basically, when he was roaming around in this region, he found a black rock. Now, again, I've got a prop. This is the kind of thing he found. So this is a, a carbonaceous chondrite meteorite. It's called a yende. And the piece that Ali found during his archaeological studies was around about the same total size as this. So he found this is a 39 gram yende. Um, he found something that was around about 30 grams. So a little bit smaller than this, but essentially when you're walking around the desert, 
a great tip. If you go out into, into the desert region, somewhere like Morocco, Tunisia, uh, Mauritania, or into Oman, and you know, you've got to be careful with local laws and permits, etc. But take a, take a cane with you with a magnet on the end, because a lot of the very dark rocks, you may be lucky and you may find a meteorite. Now, with carbonaceous chondrites, they're not very, there's virtually no magnetism in, in them. A lot of silicon, some carbon. Um, Pre-solar grains, you typically find in these, which is you know, where we're heading with this story. So, that's the second prop. So Ali's he's doing this and he finds these tiny little fragments and they get sent off and they've been studied. And what is now believed to be the case is that these fragments of meteorite, and this meteorite isn't even classified by the meteor the Met Bull, the Meteoritical Society, because not enough of it exists. And you're supposed to donate 20% over for analysis, etc. Literally, it was it was fragmented so much, tiny little fragments that there isn't enough to even give an official classification. So it's known as Hypatia. So Hypatia was an astronomer in the third, fourth century um, in Egypt. First, one of the first female astronomers, very famous. Um, typically, uh, you know, at that time, obviously, female scientists. We've got to go forward to the time of Carolyn Herschel in the 1700s and her assistance of William Herschel to, to really get recognition for female scientists. But Hypatia was this astronomer. So they gave it this name. So this tiny little set of fragments basically went under extensive chemical analysis um, for a long time. And what they now think is that this is like nothing else that's ever been found. It's like no meteorite or cometary body that's ever been found in our solar system. The reason for that is the ratios of various things. They found what's called poly, poly aromatic hydrocarbons in it. So this is essentially what, where else you find poly, poly aromatic hydrocarbons is in interstellar dust. So what they think with Hypatia is that this, the origin of this comes from outside our solar system because its chemical analysis is nothing like anything that's been found in our solar system. Meteorites of this type and combinations, kind of, et cetera, you've got high silicon levels, low carbon levels, for example. This is almost pure carbon. It's a very, very high carbon count. But also they found pure aluminium in it as well. Uh, aluminium inclusions, which again, pure metallic aluminium, it's so rare, it's just beyond, it's beyond even comprehension. So potentially we've got obviously the edge of Kuiper belt um, in between the orbits of Neptune and Pluto, which is, you know, New Horizons has been through there. And then around about one light year away, we've got the Oort cloud where we believe there are trillions of cometary bodies. And some of the initial studies on this that were published like back in 2015, 2016, thought that it had come from a cometary impact. But again, it's like nothing that's been found in our solar system. So They've gone through the analysis. They've looked at xenon levels, xenon ratios, etc. Uh, they've looked at, you know, all sorts of different, you know, compositional elements in it. And what seems to be the case, and this is where it gets quite as stunning, is they think this was created on the back of a Type One A supernova. So this is something that not only predates our solar system, but its chemical composition is nothing like the cloud. So it's essentially, when the solar system formed, you had this homogeneous cloud basically that condensed, eventually the start the condensed enough to form our sun, that then ignited, blew out the dust, etc. You got the inner rocky planets, you've got the outer gaseous planets, some of them moved. We believe that Jupiter had a bit of a, a bit of a wild time in the early time part of the solar system. Obviously, you know, we know that there was water on Mars, there was you know, potentially massive amounts of impactors around about four billion years ago, which we can see evidence of on the moon. Um, but all of this is irrelevant because that homogeneous cloud, all of the meteorites, known meteorites, etc., that have been found up to this point have got a similar composition to what they believe was in this homogeneous cloud that formed our solar system. Hypatia, all bets are off. It's like nothing that's ever been found. So they think that it's not only predating the solar system, and the evidence of that comes from the micro diamonds that are in that. Now, again, micro diamonds aren't uncommon in meteorites. This is another meteorite that has got. Uh, microscopic diamonds in it, but it's nothing like Hypatia. This is definitely, you know, either from the asteroid belt or from a large body like Vesta or Ceres, etc. Probably asteroid belt. We've got evidence. I've got a little piece of Mars here from the Tissan uh, meteorite. Again, we know the chemical composition of, you know, anything that's come from Mars due to the, the Viking spacecraft and all the other spacecraft that are landed on Mars. We can analyze where it's come from. Same with the Vestas with the HED uh, series of meteorites. The um, you know, Diogenite, etc., uh, Eucrite series of meteorites, where we know 
potentially that most of those have probably come from Vesta or a body identical to Vesta, because again, due to chemical composition and analysis from spacecraft. This one, nobody knows. Nobody knows. It's still up for debate, but the science that's been published in Icarus recently, if you wanted to read some of the papers on that, it's, it's very well documented, really is leaning towards this idea of it forming near a type 1a supernova. Now, what's interesting about type 1a supernovas is they are incredibly rare as well. So typical supernovas, you've got a star above a certain mass. Essentially, when it reaches the end of its life, it'll either form... Uh, planetary nebula, uh, nice big cloud like our sun's going to do because it's too small, or it'll go supernova and pop like Betelgeuse is going to do um, at the end of its life. And it's a solitary star, and it'll just basically, you know, gravity and nuclear pressure will kind of have a nice little battle, eventually give in, core collapse, boom, supernova happens. With a type 1a supernova, it's a binary system. So what you've got is a very, very dense white dwarf or, or even large mass, but typically a white dwarf star, which is sucking material off a nearby star. And when it exceeds what's called the Chandrasekha limit, it basically gets too big for its boots. It goes pop and it goes boom. And that's your type 1a supernova. And they use the standard candles because the luminosity of them is pretty consistent. So you can basically say, well, if we've got a type 1a supernova, you can almost measure the this. They use for measuring distances, much like Cepheid variables were in you know, the days of Hubble and, and those studies in the Andromeda galaxy. But to think that this has got micro diamonds and interstellar grains and material that predate the solar system that were formed on the back of an explosion of a binary star system where one is a white dwarf and one is another standard size star where the white dwarf is sucking the material off and then that has landed in in egypt and potentially from you know the same impactor that created this 28 million years ago blows my mind i don't know what you think terry but it's yeah. just astonishing <clears throat> yeah it was an absolute uh, uh beautiful detective story the way they eliminated all the other things first yeah. thought was well it's just interstellar dust and they looked at the composition and said no it's not like anti and interstellar yeah. dust that we have in the area and as you say they were able to rule out uh just ordinary material thrown out from a red giant and from a type 2 supernova yeah. and all that's left is a type 1a there's one thing that they find which has not been found in any body or known to be in any body in the solar system which is nickel phosphide yeah now, no chemist, but this literally was the first time that particular compound has been found anywhere. So, and the other thing, of course, is that, as you were saying, the type 1a supernovae are the standard candles for the uh, distance measurement out to the far reaches of the universe. And that ties in with the Hubble constant and all the rest of it. So yep. this, the more we can find out about type 1a supernovae, the more confident we can be, or maybe not so confident about using very early type 1a supernovae as the distance measurements for determining the rate at which the universe is expanding and the rate at which that uh, expansion is accelerating, which is the thorniest problem, problem in cosmology at the moment. So absolutely fascinating stuff. Well, that's the thing. Astronomy is typically a, a science that's done by proxy. It's done as a, you know, even by hobbyists or professionals. We can't touch and feel what's up there most of the time. You know, we can go to the moon. We've been to the moon a few times. We're going back to the moon. We may be going to Mars in the next 10 to 15 years. But, you know, deep space astrophysics is all mathematics observation radio observation gamma ray whatever pick a pick a frequency and you're observing you're not actually there but to have the ability to hold even i mean these are tiny as i said it's 30 grams the total mass of this thing they've got to go back out there i mean as you, we were saying before we came on air those sands are shifting all the time so yeah. there's going to be more stuff there um, and it'd be amazing to find more of this and to get more evidence because you think about it with, with just 30 grams using you know Things like the diamond light accelerator, though, though not that one in particular, but these nuclear probes, these, you know, the capability that we now have to analyze even microscopic amounts of material and derive so much information from it is, again, it's just mind blowing. The tiny, tiny little amounts of meteorite being able to almost conclusively, not 100%, obviously, nothing in science is 100%, but almost conclusively prove that. The progenitor this was a was this rare supernova type that was occurring billions of years potentially before our solar system was formed. Uh, yeah, sorry. So please, if you're if you're watching, 
definitely, definitely uh, have a look at the Icarus paper. Have a look at some of the other data associated with this. There's so much in it, so much research from Kramers and the team at University of Johannesburg, etc. Um, there's, there's so much there. We, as I said, it could be just from the Oort cloud. We don't know. We don't even know what's in the Oort cloud yet. We've never been. We can't even see it. We, we know it's there. We theorize it's there from you know, observations with Herschel, etc., around other star systems where we know that these like water bearing, you know, massive circular anomalies, as it were, or you know, bodies, cometary bodies potentially exist. But we don't know that the Oort cloud is there. It's one light year away. And these things, you know, if you were to take something like that, the Allende, and put it in a dark room at the back, you wouldn't be able to see it um, because it's so black. And that's the thing. They've got an albedo, about 20% that of coal um, cometary bodies until they light up and asteroids. So good luck on that one. It will happen one day. We'll have, you know, maybe the James Webb will be the first to detect something in the Oort cloud. Who knows? Um, but I, I just... When I saw this story, it's like, yeah, we're, we're having that one. We're absolutely having that one. It was so good. Anyway, last story of the evening, and then we'll move on to our, our look up section. Um, yep. This one's good as well. <laughs> this is our uh, esteemed astronomer royal, Sir Martin Rees, has come up with a very interesting idea. Not the first one, but whenever he says something, a bit like Brian Cox, who never says anything that's totally original, but they, uh, once he says it, the media pick it up immediately. Anyway, as we all know, there are problems when you have human beings in space, all sorts of problems. Uh, and if we're ever going to go further away than the moon, they become very, very significant. For a start, they're very long journeys. Uh, with present technology, a journey to Mars is about eight months and another eight months to come back again. Imagine being stuck even in, say, that relatively large uh, Boeing spacecraft for that length of time. They're cramped spaces. Uh, you have either low or zero gravity in your spacecraft unless they come up with some artificial gravity system like uh, rotating uh, cylinders, that sort of thing. You have significant dangers from radiation, both solar and cosmic rays, when you're outside the, uh, the Earth's Van Allen belts, which protect us quite a bit on the outside our atmosphere. You're in close quarters with your other crewmates for long periods. If you're landing on the Moon or Mars, you have practically no atmosphere at all. You have to bring you or grow your own food. Uh, obviously, you know, your own oxygen and uh, the, the water can be recycled and so on. But basically, human beings are not designed for space flight. And what Sir Martin is saying that the solution in the longer term, maybe medium to longer term, is human cyborg mixtures, part cyborg, a mixture of flesh and blood and electronic uh, components. Now, I looked this up. Cyborg comes from cybernetic and organism, the organism being the human part, and cybernetic is defined as biomechatronic parts. So basically you have usually clothed neatly in human flesh, uh, but with uh, internal components that are a mixture of uh, mechanical parts and electrical and artificial intelligence and all the rest of it. They're beloved in science fiction. You have the six, the earliest one I could come across and sort of the, what most people would be aware of might be the six million dollar man. Mm -hmm. You have Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker, the Terminator, Robocop, General Grievous, and of course, all sorts of uh, creatures in video games and so on. So they're, they're really fantastic for the... Uh, the modern CGI effects that you can do in uh, in films and, and TV programs and so on. But is it realistic? Well, who am I to argue with Sir Sir Martin Rees? Um, the I will. thing is, <laughs> oh, good for you, right? Yes, I, I could have anticipated that actually. Uh, you can indeed, I mean, we have fully robotic things now. Uh, which work and presumably have more or less indefinite lifetimes. Uh, you, all mechanical parts can wear out right, um, eventually, but uh, with AI and, and other robots, you can simply replace the parts as the way I, as they wear out right, the way you're 
uh, replace the base brake discs on your car it can be done easily enough what i don't quite get is the human interface because human cells at the moment anyway still have a limited <laughs> lifetime they <laughs> die basically they we die. all are going to die so why do you need the human bit of it at all why not be completely robotic and then you don't have to worry about heart attacks or glaucoma or strokes or anything like that or, or sort of even cutting yourself and bleeding because you know the, usually these things are clothed in human skin with some sort of uh, musculature as well even if uh, they, the strength and the power and the ability to do almost impossible things is all hidden in the, the megatronic aspect of it but yeah there is a lot of validity in the idea of uh trying to get around the vulnerability and the unsuitability of human beings for long duration space flight and indeed for surviving on hostile environments like uh, on Mars. I mean, on, on the moon, you can go there, stay for a week, two weeks, three weeks, come back again. On Mars, once you go, you're going to be there for at least six months before the alignment of the planets is suitable for you to start a return journey again. And at the moment, human beings are just not uh, suited for that sort of um, environment. You need to be shielded from that radiation, which means basically sort of going underground. If, if Mars had something like the lava tubes that we see on the moon, and we think there are some there, then that would be ideal. But there's re relatively limited uh, exploration you can do if you're stuck inside a lava tube. So anyway, it is uh, certainly an idea worth exploring. I think in the very longer term, it will all be done totally robotically. But uh, in the meantime, maybe the cyborg, the combination of part human and a part robot is the solution. And as you said, Nick, you have your own views on, on Sir Martin. So I, 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 yeah. on this. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll just say that firstly, Sir Martin, Professor Sir Martin Rees, I mean, he is an eminent astronomer. He is a you know superb astronomer and should stick to astronomy. Um he is, you know, I, I'm not going to slate him as an individual. He is, you know, brilliant in his field. But, you know, as Professor Ian Crawford at Birkbeck University and I and Ian Crawford has, has talked on many occasions, the whole argument of using robots versus humans. I mean, you've got the socio-economic side. Yes, you've got the economics. It's a lot cheaper to send a robot anywhere because you don't have the life support systems, you don't have you know the potential risks, etc. But then who's going to remember the first robot to land on, you know, whatever? You know, yes, we remember Viking. Yes, we remember, you know, things like Giotto, etc. But let's not forget that the greatest technical achievement in human history, and argue this with me till the cows come home, anyone please, was the Apollo space program. The ability to land humans on another body using the technology at the time was still, in my opinion, the greatest technical, technical, not the greatest achievement, the greatest technical achievement in human history. And that will only be surpassed when we land humans on the surface of Mars as a technical achievement. Now, as you said, you're right. There are issues. The radiation is a major, major issue. You've got bone degradation and muscle wastage. You've got, you know, the whole, the Mars 500 crew, you know, behind the scenes, half of them were trying to kill each other. And that was in a car park in Russia. So it, that wasn't even a real long duration space mission. That was just, uh, you know, the isolation issues, the being away from, there's, there's all sorts of psychological issues, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is that it is innate, and this is quoting, you know, Rusty Schweikart from Apollo 9, it is innate in the human spirit to explore. And if we don't explore, it'll just be robots and it'll just be augmented reality and virtual reality. And yes, we could put a robot, a human, a humanoid sized scale type robot on the surface of Mars. We've already got rovers on the surface of Mars with stereoscopic cameras. You can put somebody in a VR headset, you know, in the future with more advanced robotics where you've got real time motion capabilities where rather than, you know, with the rovers at the moment, they trundle a few meters or maybe a few, kilo, you know, a few hundred meters a day. And then they've got to stop and they've got to use a hazard avoidance detection systems. Being able to almost have an avatar as it were on the surface of another world which you're controlling from on the ground yes there are advantages to that there are benefits to that but 
it's not being there. And this is the whole argument that will rage on forever. Apollo, you know, you look at post-Apollo. Since Apollo, we've brought back a few hundred grams of material between the Chinese mission, sample return missions, and, you know, the Russian missions. On Apollo, they were picking up rocks like nothing on Earth. They, you know, hundreds of kilograms of rocks that are still being studied to this day. With Mars, until we get boots on the ground on Mars, we're not going to have definitive answer to many of the questions on Mars. Like, is there still life there? Yes, you could send a drill down. But then if you send a drill down and you find something in the microscope and one of the rovers says, oh, potentially that's a fossil, you're still going to have people saying, well, is it, is it not? Until we put boots on the ground, we're not going to have definitive answers. And yes, there is a limit with current technology to what humans are able to do. Until we get cryogenic suspension and all the things that we see, as you said, in science fiction, you know, you talk about Darth Vader and you know, all of the other characters that you mentioned uh, in terms of cybernetics. Yes, but we've also got, you know, again, from science fiction, you, you go back to the days of Star Trek and you look at some of the innovations that are now coming around due to science fiction becoming science fact. You look at Thunderbirds and what Elon Musk is doing, with, you know, is <laughs> SpaceX are basically Thunderbird 1. Um, he's, he's landing a spacecraft, a full vertical rocket, you know, straight back down again so science fiction does eventually become science fact when we advance our technology or sometimes it can spur on the advancement of that technology once we get to cryogenic suspension we've got the the ability to as we have with some frogs etc to be able to suspend animation and slow down the metabolic system and say okay well you know somebody is going to age but you know, physically you know there's all sorts of research going into cell degradation as well at the moment that's to me where real exploration still needs to happen. Being able to go out, you look at the movie Outland in the late 1970s, early 80s with Sean Connery and you know, mining the moons of Jupiter. And yes, you've got the radiation issues, etc. But there's so much exploration still to be done. And we've still got to get back to the moon. I mean, it's, it still blows my mind. It's 50 years since we've been to the moon, pretty much. Um, once we get back to the moon, I think the impetus... And the realization once we start getting really into lunar exploration again, the impetus to go on to Mars and the impetus to then go on potentially further, I think will grow. And then, you know, with the ability that we potentially will we will have with nuclear propulsion systems and be able to visit other star systems, even if it's just a flyby to the planetary system near Alpha Proxima Centauri. But can you imagine, you know, if when the James Webb comes online and we start detecting potential evidence for planetary atmospheres that could host life, are we just going to say, oh, we'll send a robot out? We're going to want to have the capability, not now, but at some point, probably in the distant future, to be able to explore. And that is my fundamental argument with Professor Sir Martin Rees and everything he's ever said. He said, and I quote, I mean, it's, it's a, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but Apollo was a waste of money to him. He thought it was too expensive. It should never have happened. But then you look at the inspiration it provided, look at the technological spin-offs it provided, look at, you know, it united a planet like nothing in history has pretty much ever done. So to say that we're going to chuck a robot up there, yeah, great. Well, Rosetta was fantastic going around Comet 67P and Phil I bouncing on the surface. whoop de doo um, It's not Apollo. You lived through Apollo, Terry. You know exactly yep. what it was. You know, that day in 1969 when Armstrong set foot on the lunar surface. And anyone who was alive at that point will know exactly how that felt. And I personally, and my kids personally, can't wait to see that happen again. Because I think, you know, even though it's it's been done before, it's not been done in most people's lifetimes. Mm -hmm. So that's my argument. Yeah. And we got better pictures of it this time. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Hopefully, uh, the Alan Bean, <laughs> blessed God rest his soul, Alan Bean, won't trash the camera, or whoever the Alan Bean is, yeah. won't trash the camera. Uh, I remember watching uh, Apollo 11 live, and I couldn't even work out what I was saying, partly because the image was upside down the first time, but even when they got it right, the images were so blurred and grainy and so now admittedly they got a lot better with the uh, the later apollo ones but yeah. uh, i'm sure when they go back and land on the moon um the next time we will get fantastic well, live images think about it we're gonna yeah. get live high definition i mean you know we're getting high definition from mars literally within seconds of landing yeah. pretty much now in nasa um they're just remarkable. So please, ESA, if anyone from ESA is listening, don't get involved because we don't want what happened with Rosetta with the embargoes <laughs> and all that 
forget that. It's just not going to happen. Next lunar mission we want, obviously, we high definition of the landing, we want high definition of the first steps, etc., etc., etc. We want it in three IMAX, you know, 360 panoramic. Right. You know, you only have to look at what Tom Cruise is doing with planes to see what can be achieved. Um, it's it's what people are going to want. And don't forget, in the 1960s, we didn't have social media. We didn't have Twitter. Mm. We didn't have all of these ways that people could share the experience. People would sit huddled around a black and white, or if you were very lucky, a color television, but still watching black and white photographs, um, to watch this happening in their own little rooms or maybe in groups or maybe at Times Square. But what we now have is really the ability to unite the planet in something truly spectacular. And it's not, you know, no robotic mission. And I've lived through Viking and Voyager and New Horizons and Galileo and, you know, Cassini and Giotto landing. Yeah, they're all fantastic. And, you know, for somebody who's into this, in this space bubble that we're in and who loves space like we do, it's fantastic. But to the average person in the street, you ask them, who was the first astronaut on the ISS? They wouldn't have a clue. You ask them who was, you know, what was the first robot to you know, go outside the solar system? Most people wouldn't know. But you say, who was the first human being to land on the moon? And 99% of people will say Neil Armstrong. And that's the difference between a robot and a human being is the inspiration that it provides. And you only have to look at every single astronaut from that, you know, the shuttle onwards you know what and ask them what inspired them what inspired them to become an astronaut what inspired them to get into space you know you talk to elon musk you talk to you know chris lewicki you know people who've worked at nasa who've landed spacecraft on mars what was the thing that got them into space apollo end of story it's still something that nasa cling on to to this day because it is their greatest achievement forget the shuttle shuttle was a great achievement from a technical standpoint and you know to put you know a national hero in john young on the first flight with bob Crippen is it's still amazing um it's not what they're doing with the sls let's put it that way you know this is it was an untested technology sds one and they still put a national hero and an astro another astronaut on it at the same time um we need that that's that to me is where the difference lies between robots and humans. It's not only the scientific capability that a human geologist will have. You know, Harrison Schmidt, don't forget, was a human geologist, the only true scientist, for want of a better term, to, to visit another another world. And what he brought back and what he discovered was amazing in itself. And that's what we need. We don't need crackpot images coming back, you know, people saying, oh, look, there's a door on Mars or there's a dog on Mars. You know, that's the that's the thing, <laughs> because we've still got people, 28 million people in America still don't believe we landed on the moon. So, yeah, we've we've got to do this. We've got to you know, do it properly. And yes, there will be a place for you know, augmented systems, be it virtual reality, augmented reality. You know, full robotic systems where somebody's controlling it from the ground. Yes, they all have their place, but the human interface saying, yes, you could get a, a robot to splash some paint, got a Jackson Pollock. You haven't. You you haven't got that, or a constant, you know, a million monkeys with a million typewriters could type the works of Shakespeare. They couldn't. That's the difference. That's the key thing here. It's it's a human emotional thing, and no robot is ever going to deliver that. No matter how many cuddly toys the European Space Agency release, how many plushies, whatever, it's not the same. Rant over. Right. Okay. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> yeah. You say what you think. Right. For look up, I'll go through this fairly quickly. We're running a wee bit out of yeah. time. There are yeah. a couple of uh, things, all naked eye stuff, so you don't need a telescope for this. This is the season for what are called noctilucent clouds, NLCs, and they're relative nearby. They're actually in our upper atmosphere. Noctilucent means night shining, and that is exactly what they are. They're uh, little clouds of dust, I'll say a bit more about which are so high up that the sun illuminates them, even when it's well below the horizon, too far below the horizon to uh, illuminate normal, what we call tropospheric clouds. And why are they of interest to astronomers? Because we believe they are made up of meteoric dust, the very, very fine particles that are left behind in the upper atmosphere whenever meteors burn up Burning is not quite the right term, but it'll do in the upper atmosphere. <laughs> um, 
So you're saying basically the the dying dust, if you like, of the meteors that burn up in the Earth's atmosphere, they're observed above the North and South Poles. And we see them at this time of year, mainly for reasons of temperature that uh, occur at that high altitude uh, at this time of year. So you look uh, for about an hour or so on either side of your local midnight, ignoring summertime, think of rail time, and low down in the north, and you see these beautiful, wispy, ethereal, silvery clouds. And if you take photos, you can see structure in them. If you take videos or time-lapse photography, you can see the way they move. They're absolutely beautiful. They're unpredictable, but except that this is the time of year that we see them for about the next six to eight weeks or so. So you need a clear horizon to the north, and uh, obviously a clear sky and they're beautiful one scene uh, you'll wonder how you sort of you ever missed them if you if you didn't see them before they're they're really lovely uh night shining silvery white clouds little wispy patterns mainly horizontal patterns but some other structure as well so any clear night from now until <clears throat> Roughly the end of July, uh, you can see them, and they're they're well worth seeing. As I say, you don't need a telescope or binoculars. Next thing is the summer solstice, twenty second of June. The sun will reach its most northerly point as it travels around the ecliptic at ten thirteen British summer time. After that, for the benefit of astronomers, the nights get start getting longer again, more astronomy. But the best to last, what I call the parade of the planets. Oh. Now I have been observing the sky, believe it or not, for nearly 60 years, and I have never seen this. You can see all of the five naked eye planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, together in the sky at the same time at various occasions. That's not all that rare, although lots of people have never managed to do it. But to see all of those five naked eye planets in their order from the sun, in other words, moving outwards in that order, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn is pretty rare. I have seen that before. But what we will see at the end of June is also another body in the correct order, the moon which of course you see the earth all the time, but the moon is the earth satellite. So for a period from roughly the 20th to the 27th of June in the morning sky, you will be able to see all of those bodies at the same time. And during the uh, period of the 23rd to the 26th of June, the moon will be in order also in that pattern. The moon obviously moves across the sky pretty quickly. So any night between the 23rd and the 26th of June, or early morning of those dates, you will see Mercury, Venus, the moon, then Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Best of all will be on either the 24th or the 25th of June, when the moon will be roughly halfway in between Venus and Mars in the sky. Now, you might want to photograph that. The problem is that it spans about 105 degrees across the sky. So unless you have an extremely wide angle lens, in which case there'll be other imaging issues with that, unless you have an extremely wide angle lens, you'll need to take a couple of photographs and stitch them together, uh, which is very easy to do with modern software. What about the other planets? Uranus and Neptune are there too. Unfortunately, they are not in exactly the same order out from the sun, but they are there. But you will need either good binoculars or a telescope to see them. So the trouble at this time of year, of course, particularly if you're the, in the northern part of these islands, you get an awful lot of twilight. It's going to be quite difficult to see Mercury at all. And in fact, if you want to see Mercury with the naked eye alone, you need to be in pretty much the, the more southerly parts of uh, England and Ireland. You can use binoculars to find it first. Once you find it, you should be able to see it with the naked eye, unless, as I say, you're, you're further north than, say, Manchester. It gets a bit difficult then. But this is something as I say, I've never seen in my life of 60, uh, almost 60 years of observing, to see all that in the right order. Nothing of great scientific interest, just uh, something that is rather special 
uh, almost unique and well worth having a go. And if you manage to see that, you'll probably not see it again for a very, very long time. So let's hope for clear skies. What you want to do is to go out for about, a, say, an hour before local sunrise when the sky is still relatively dark. You will see all the, uh, the outer planets moving inwards, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Venus. Then you need to wait to roughly 30 to 40 minutes before local sunrise to try and see Mercury. It will be very low down in the twilight. But have a go. If you succeed, you'll be very pleased. Yeah, I'm putting a link. Um, so I'll put a link in some images I've taken. You're talking about these wide fields of view. Um, so that Flickr link that's just come in uh, now into the chat, that's some images I took as from LLCs going back a few years with a very, very basic setup. So that was a little Canon EOS 10D that I picked up from eBay for next to nothing. Quite an old Canon digital camera. Um, two or three second exposures and on a five quid tripod that I got on a car boot sale. I literally just took about three different separate images. And as you said, really easy to stitch them together. And that, again, you can see the, the, you know, the field of view on that is around about what we're looking at here with this parade of the planet. So if you're doing NLC shots, use that to practice ahead of this parade of the planets, as it were. I've also, there's another link that I've put in the chat that's hopefully going to go up soon um, with space.com, which is a fantastic website. Totally recommend it. It's a great you know, news source and Terry and I use it and look at it quite a lot as well. Um, but they've got a really good kind of summary of what's coming because we're not going to be on now for a month of what's coming in the next month, but that parade of the planets and how it's going to be strung out across the sky. They've got a really good kind of CG image of what that's going to look like. As Terry said, We've not seen this in our lifetime. Yeah. So if you've got the ability with a digital wide field camera, you know, even a simple lens, you don't need anything fancy. Don't get one of these fancy zoom lenses. You want a, a small mm -hmm. like 28 millimeter, 28 to 58, 55 mil fisheye or you know, similar kind of lens. Stick it on a long exposure. You will get Uranus and Neptune. Anything over about five, six second exposure, if the skies are really good and clear, you're going to pick up those. There'll be tiny little dots. You won't be able to perceive any structure or anything on them, but you will get everything. And that, to me, is going to be one of the best shots, you know, that will come out this year. It's it's something that people just haven't seen. Um, and you think about the Voyager and the Grand Tour and, you know, the whole tour of the planets. We've got this. It's right in front of us, this fantastic, yep. like and more tour of the planet so uh definitely one to look out for it starts around about the 10th so this friday this kind of alignment and you know early morning start you've got to be far south as terry said um i'm quite lucky i live in the south of england i know you terry you're planning on trip traveling yep. all the way down uh ireland as well to see some of this so best of luck on that one um it's going to be spectacular. So that's the one to see. That and the NLCs. Um, any of you who are following the show, if you take pictures of not to lose some clouds, yep. please, you know, tweet them. Yeah, we'd love to see your stuff and the questions that have been coming in, in the comments. Yeah, thanks, Chris. You know, definitely the SCS one John Young was. Yeah, John Young to me is the astronaut's astronaut. I mean, the guy had a heart rate of 75 when he was landing on the moon, for God's sake. I mean, he's like, and when the SDS one was taking off, I think his heart rate peaked at 78. Um the, the man's made of steel, uh, or he was, uh, God rest his soul, but fantastic. Um, yeah, augmented, you know, what, what, what we're seeing with um, cyborgs and cybernetic systems. Yes, the hint on Elon Musk and what he's thinking there. Yeah, I agree again, Chris. Um, but thank you again for anyone who's watching, anyone who's listening. Great questions, great comments. Um, hopefully you're enjoying the show as much as ever. Um, this, like, once a month slot, it's given us a bit more time to think about what we're going to do, what we're going to say, and hopefully bring you some real crackers. As, as I hope you agree, story. Yeah. So, um, any final words, Terry? Happy tomorrow. birthday to Ground Brace Space for tomorrow. Oh, happy birthday, indeed. Yeah. Thank you very much. Chris, that one. Okay. Oh, Cheers, we'll everybody. Back to our great friends at Space Store. I was just going to end on that note. Happy birthday to Ground Brace Space. Um, but thank you once again, Nick and Terry, for another amazing show. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Um, yeah. As Nick mentioned, we'll be switching to a monthly roundup. Still bringing you latest and greatest from space. If you don't follow us on social media, um, find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever you are. We are there too. Um, well, take care, guys. Have a very good evening, very good rest of your evenings. Enjoy the sunshine. Yep. And take care. Peace, guys, everybody. See you in a month. Peace, guys. Bye. Adios. Bye. Bye. Bye.
Hi, uh, my name's Nick Howes, space enthusiast, author, writer, broadcaster. Hi, I'm Terry Mosley, past president of the Irish Astronomical Association, lifelong astronomy and space nerd, absolutely fascinated by everything both man-made and natural up there. So every two weeks, Terry and I give you the latest, hottest news from space and uh, human spaceflight, robotic spaceflight, and what's happening up in the skies. Um, please tune in to us every fortnight uh, with the space stuff. Hi, all.